technology. And I'm the new kid at this job. Ani, Goju, good morning. And Sharon, is there anything you need to share? Okay, I have a couple of announcements. It sounds kind of loud, though. We're getting regrouped. <laughs> For those of you who are stone deaf, this will be just fine. Uh, let's see, I have three announcements here. Three or four. Um, so today, October the, sorry, not today. On October the 8th, Thanksgiving Sunday, we are asked to uh, greet the Reverend Rebecca Plegas, who is our, in fact, our, our interim. interim pastor. She'll be here for the first time. And we're being asked if you have one of those This Lutheran Loves You t-shirts, please wear it as a welcoming gesture to uh, Pastor Plegas. And Tuesday coming up, this coming week is another hymn sing at our Saviors with, of course, a potluck. How can we have a gathering of Lutherans without a potluck? So that's this Tuesday from 6 to 7 p.m. is supper and 7.30 to 8.30 is the hymn sing. So don't eat too much or your tummy will be too full and you won't be able to sing lustily with your diaphragm. Sure, we look forward to that. Um, next up on the calendar is October 15th, is the Blessing of the Pets uh, celebration, and there's been a slide presented on that, so please bring your well-mannered pets and clean up after them, etc. <laughs> that's, that's on the 15th. And lastly, from Council, actually Michelle, we're coming up with Thanksgiving. Uh, celebration next weekend, next Sunday. So she's looking for Thanksgiving donations of items we can use to decorate the altar area. So if you have something, corn stalks, hay bales, whatever you wish to uh, donate, if you can bring it and drop it off between the doors right here this week and before Friday, because I think that's the day she's going to come in and set it all up. So we look forward to those donations. Sure, you had nothing to say today at the moment. Okay. Let us begin with our land acknowledgments. We acknowledge the indigenous peoples whose traditional territory we have gathered on today. This place where we come together is within the ancestral and traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, including the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation and the Métis. The two First Nations communities in Grey Bruce are the Chippewas and the Nawash, unceded First Nation, and the Saugeen First Nation. We acknowledge the many long standing treaty relationships between Indigenous nations in Canada. We recognize that we all have a role to play in honoring the treaties and, contri and contributing to reconciliation. New question. We're called to worship. Thank you. 
Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. First reading for today is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb considering concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are seven inch. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Note that all lives are mine. The life of the parent, as well as the life of the child, is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? 
When the righteous turn away from the righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For in the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die for it. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed, and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life. Because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed, they shall surely live. They shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is unfair. O oh, house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore I will judge you, O oh, house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. The word of the Lord. A song for today is Psalm 25, verses 1 to 9, sung responsibly by the verse. sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind and in the same love, being in full, in full accord out of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you who is in Christ Jesus. Although he was in the form of God, did not regard the quality of God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and 
every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our speaker today is. We're going to do saying these things to him, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, for she said to herself, I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the food players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. This is the gospel of our Lord. Greetings, friends. My name is Michael Price, and I'm the Bishop of the Eastern Center. It's a privilege to be with you today. And I want to thank you for providing your pastor or deacon with so much needed relief and time for rest and restoration. The ELCIC Summer Servant Series is a wonderful opportunity for us to support our Boston leaders and to experience something of the amazing breadth of our wonderful church from coast to coast to coast. And I'm delighted to be a part of this effort. By all appearances, it was a chance encounter. Jesus, it seems, had just finished delivering a message to a large crowd that had followed him to the lakeside and was walking somewhere. Perhaps he was trying to steal a few hours alone, quiet contemplation. 
Maybe he was just on his way to the next preaching point. Or maybe he was, in fact, looking for someone. Someone or some persons who would go with him and help him in the spreading of this new word of good news, this new gospel. Nonetheless, the scriptures tell us that he saw this man identified as Matthew sitting at the tax booth. As a matter of fact, that's just about all the scriptures tell us that Jesus saw him. There was no great party in the heavens, no loud voices booming from the skies. Indeed, there was no indication that this man was anything other than what he appeared to be, a junior clerk in the Roman equivalent of Canada customs, going about his daily business of collecting taxes from those who were transporting goods along the road that Jesus happened to be traveling. But that was Jesus' way, wasn't it? Think of all the stories from the Gospels where Jesus saw what no one else saw. The widow who gave all that she had into the alms box. The woman he met one day at the well side. That little tax man, Zacchaeus. In all these instances and so many more, Jesus sees and Jesus calls. It's an action repeated again and again through the Gospels and an action that we see repeated again and again in the lives of any who have come to see themselves as followers of Jesus from that time right until today. It's a great little story. But it's not just Matthew's story or any of the other disciples' story for that matter. It's also my story and it's your story. God has seen each of us and has called each of us not just the disciples or the bishops, the pastors, the deacons, but all of us. And even today in this gathering, all of us are seen and all of us are called to a new way of living, a new way of seeing, a new way of being. That was certainly the case for Matthew. I'm not quite sure that Matthew knew what he was in for when he got up and put the closed sign in the window of his little tax booth that afternoon. Jesus calls him and says, follow me. And then where does Jesus go? But to Matthew's own house. Furthermore, it seems he must have issued a few more invitations along the way, because the next thing we know, there's a whole crowd of, quote, tax collectors and sinners sitting in Matthew's dining room having a big party. This is Jesus' particular take on, guess who's coming to dinner? In the space of just two verses, Matthew the tax man, Matthew the gatherer, Matthew the collector, the taker, becomes Matthew the giver, Matthew the distributor, Matthew the designated host. I think the gospel writer is using a narrative device, a storytelling method that provides a powerful description of the dynamics of conversion. Jesus sees, Jesus calls, Matthew answers in the affirmative, and then immediately significant changes begin to happen in his life. Jesus says, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those of us who are sick. More and more of us are recognizing our own sickness, our own need of conversion to a new way of life, I think more and more of us are feeling that we're on treadmills that are running faster and faster, but ultimately leading nowhere. We know that in global terms, we are the richest of the rich. Yet morally and spiritually, a lot of us are feeling more and more impoverished. It was described really well in an article I read recently where an East Indian teacher lamenting the massive change being experienced in her country said, we are trading a simple life with high thought for a cluttered life with low thought. It was an observation that I certainly identified with as a North American. The fact is, in spite of our riches, and maybe because of them, 
We are flirting with a disaster in a society we live in. A life we don't need. In another article, Tanis Kellowell, a management consultant with the Vance School of Management, writes Everywhere I go, I sense a chronic, low grade depression in people, a soul sickness. Many intelligent, hard working, well educated people are feeling as if they've sold their souls for paychecks. Do you recognize what she's talking about? I sure do. And all of this carries profound significance for us when we reflect on the nature and mission of the church. I think there's a lot of receptivity to hearing Jesus call to follow him, a call to a new way of living, a new way of seeing and being. I find myself encountering more and more people all the time who are recognizing the high price we're paying for the kind of a world we're living in. More and more people who are giving up on the God of upward mobility. People who are more and more open to experiencing the God of downward and outward mobility that has been revealed to us in Jesus. But you know, it may well be that the church, we ourselves, need to be converted before we can effectively issue that same call to others. Maybe the problem isn't so much a lack of receptivity in the community, but rather our lack of faith in the power of the gospel to convert, to effect change, and bring that new life which we identify as being present in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Some years ago, a Harvard business professor, Theodore Levitt, wrote a classic article that focused on the demise of the railroad industry in North America around the turn between the 19th and 20th centuries. The decline of the industry, he says, didn't come about because people in freight no longer needed transportation. The railroads declined, rather, because the railway managers started to believe that they were the railroad and not in the transportation business. They confused the means, railroads, engines, tracks, with the ends. Transportation, moving stuff and people. He contrasts this with the example of the Stanley Tool Company. Apparently, they trained their salespeople not to sell electric drills, but to sell holes. They know that one day lasers are going to replace mechanical drills, and they want to be ready. And so they are in the whole making business. The means, the mechanical drill, is only a way to get to the whole. It's not the end in itself. Now, can you see any analogies from the church? How many congregations believe that they are in the we exist for ourselves business? as opposed to the we are in a mission to the community business. How many congregations and Christians are confusing the means with the ends? I suspect there are many people in our communities who are hoping to experiencing the kind of conversion that Matthew experienced. People who are coming to know the emptiness and the hollowness of the false gospels upon which much of our life is founded. But they're not going to look for that new life in communities, in churches that haven't already experienced a similar conversion. They won't take seriously the witness of a church that doesn't believably express the new life that we claim to be calling others to embrace. They won't be drawn to the life of a church which appears to be more interested in the church business than in the God and people business. Matthew was called to lead one way of life and to embrace another. The question this story presents to us is a simple one. What am I as an individual being called to lead and then called to embrace? What is it that we as a church are being called to lead and then being called to embrace? Thank you.
God give us the courage to ask those questions in sincerity and truth, along with ears that are open to hear the answers that God would have us hear, and then gift us with the resolve to act decisively in response. Hymn of the day, Jesus calls us for the tumult in 696. trust and hope, we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed found on the overhead screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, our only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born for his eternity, suffered by the conscious God, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended to the day. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will work on the judge to go to death and dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the living life of the Lord. You may remain seated or kneel for the prayers. <clears throat> Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come here to the Holy One in prayer. You crown your church with steadfast love and mercy. Guide us continually in our baptismal covenant to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. These are diverse gifts in service for the whole people of God. Merciful God, you satisfy the needs of all creatures, protect the habitats of fish and birds, repair ecosystems damaged by misuse, neglect, or natural disaster that all creatures may thrive. Merciful God, Receive Make your ways known to all people. Inspire the rulers and leaders of nations with your compassion and mercy. Raise up activists and community organizers 
to restore places affected by violence, poverty, and inequality. Merciful God, receive our prayer. He provide justice for all who are oppressed and relief to all who are afflicted. Heal those who are bent over by addiction, depression, and anxiety. Set free all who cry out under the weight of mental, emotional, or physical distress. Today we pray especially for Gertrude Orville, Susan, Ralph, Spencer, Karen, Peter, Tyson, Klaus, Andy, Ron, Neil, Joyce, Roseanne, Audrey, Helen, Pat, Phyllis, and Guy, as well as all those we name before you, either silently or out loud. Help us to trust your promise and not be afraid. Merciful God, receive our prayer. prayer. You call us to delight in the Sabbath. Renew our bodies, minds, and spirits in this worshiping assembly. Give rest to all who lead our congregation for worship, study, and service. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Generations bless your holy name. We give you thanks for the community of saints who have gathered in prayer and praise in this place. Support us in your love until we rest forever in you. Merciful God. Arise, O God, and sustain your creation. We pray for all places and peoples affected by natural disasters. Recently, the earthquake in Morocco, flooding in Libya, wildfires in both British Columbia and the territories, transform the devastation of floods, earthquakes, and wildfire into fertile ground of new life and growth. Merciful God, are there any other prayers? Let your loving kindness be upon this world. Be your helper and shield in places torn by strife, violence, and war, especially Ukraine. Raise up courageous leaders to govern with compassion, justice, trustworthiness, and integrity. Merciful God, receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love. Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us share a sign of God's peace with one another.
There'll be more opportunity for peaceful sharing with them, not being like this. Our Catholic of Thanksgiving for today, come thou fount of every blessing, come be our seven. <laughs> Spirit of truth, O God, rekindle your gifts within us, renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call on you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory forever. Amen. Amen. In 599, Lord Jesus, think on me. Give us this day our daily bread, and 
forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from us. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory, for every man, for every man. Now receive into your hearts and into your lives the blessings of our Lord. The peace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen. Amen. Our sending hymn is 545, Jesus dismiss us with your blessing.